Let's do a recap on uh, what we covered in lecture the other day. Um, we're talking about the origin of mammals, uh, and it is important to remember that in biology, uh, everything comes down to two basic things. Uh, that is calories in uh, and offspring out, uh, or more colloquially, uh, food and sex. Uh, the success of organisms is a function of how many calories they take in and how many offspring they're able to produce. So when we're talking about the evolution of mammals, we should be thinking along those terms. So we have a number of problems that we have to address. Uh, and the first is, we know that mammals are derived from reptiles, uh, and reptiles are extremely uh, efficient. Uh, so they are ectothermic. Uh, they're not wasting any energy on keeping their bodies above ambient temperature. Um, mammals do that. So mammals are wasting a lot of energy. And of course, the energy that you spend on thermoregulation is energy uh, that you can't spend on uh, offspring. So, um, so as we talk about mammals, there are a few key characteristics that they have. Uh, we already mentioned the fact that they are endothermic. Uh, that is, they have a higher body temperature than uh, uh, than the environment. Um, usually they have a higher body temperature than the environment. Um, they, I guess what I should say is they maintain their body temperature within a very specific range uh, and they generate that body heat uh, via metabolism. Uh, reptiles on the other hand generate that body heat from external sources. Uh, so uh, one thing that goes along with endothermia is the presence of fur. Uh, so all mammals, all mammals have fur. Uh, even whales have fur if they have eyelashes. Um, so hair is a, is a, a defining characteristic of the mammals. Um, it is a problem in trying to explain the evolution of fur, but we'll address that in just a few moments. Uh, the other key component uh, to being a mammal is that mammals nurse their young. Uh, all mammals nurse their young in one way or another. Um, Placental mammals, so metatherian and eutherian mammals, uh, have organized mammary glands or teats. Uh, the monotremes do not. They do, however, have sebaceous glands in the ventrum of the body. Uh, so they do have uh, mammary tissue. It's just not organized into a teat. Of course, the monotremes don't have lips. They can't suck. Um, but they are capable of licking up this liquid that is produced. So the sebaceous glands are really nothing more than sweat glands, uh, and they are sweating profusely uh, when they're rearing their young, and the young will lick that up. So they are providing that nutrient for the offspring. There are some other key characteristics uh, to being a mammal. Uh, so it's not just uh, teats and fur. Uh, it is also the fact that they have a synapsid skull design. So all mammals have a synapsid skull design. Uh, rather than the diapsid design that you see in um, most reptiles and birds, or the anapsid design that you see in the turtles. Um, we'll talk about that more in just a second. The other key characteristic is that mammals, the lower jaw is made up of just a single bone, namely the dentary, uh, while in reptiles there are seven. Uh, additionally, mammals have three inner ear bones rather than just the one that you see in birds and uh, reptiles. So birds and reptiles have just the columella. Mammals have uh, the malleus, which is equivalent to the columella. And then the incus and the stapes. The incus and stapes are derived from the quadrate and articular bones uh, that make up the jaw joint of the reptile. Here you see examples of the various skull designs. Uh, if there is one temporal opening, as in the upper left here, uh, that is the synapsid design. Uh, at the bottom is the anapsid design, and lower right is the diapsid design. Uh, there was also a reptilian experiment with what's called the uriapsid design, uh, but that lineage went extinct. So all extant uh, higher vertebrates have either an anapsid, synapsid, or diapsid design. Uh, the nice thing about the diapsid design is that it enables skull kinesis. Um, so the skull is kinetic. Uh, the upper jaw can go up. Obviously not in this illustration, but uh, if you think about how a bird opens its bill, the upper bill goes up and the lower bill goes down. 
Uh, in snakes, the entire uh, jaws are disarticulated and they're able to swallow prey items that are much bigger than their heads. In mammals, when you open your mouth, uh, the lower jaw goes down, the upper jaw stays stationary. Uh, why is it that mammals have this synapsid design? Uh, the key advantage to the synapsid design is that it makes room for the temporalis muscle. Uh, the temporalis muscle goes from the coronoid process of the uh, dentary bone to the back of the skull. Uh, the fact that that opening is there means that the temporalis muscle can attach to the top of the skull and of course, when it contracts, it can bulge out, meaning that you can have a much larger muscle and therefore a much more powerful bite. So now we can talk about um, what uh, factors might have led to the evolution of mammals. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things that we need to look at. Uh, let's go back and look at uh, these two skulls. It's a pelicus sore on the top uh, and then a, a therapsid a reptile down below. The therapsids were derived from the pelicosaurs. Uh, and there are a couple of key points. First of all, note that the pelicosaur has a uh, synapsid design, um, as does the therapsid, um, meaning that there is room for that temporalis muscle to uh, attach to the top of the skull, bulge out, so the animal can have a much uh, stronger bite. Uh, well, that's all about feeding. Remember, it's calories in, babies out. So a big part of this is design change here is going to be about feeding. Uh, notice too, especially in the therapsid, that there's a lot of variation in the sizes and shapes of the teeth. Um, so there's this first element of uh, heterodonty, namely different kinds of teeth. Notice also uh, the back part of the jaw, named the, uh, where you have the label A. Uh, that's the angular process, or the angular bone in this case, in mammals that becomes the angular process. And it's sort of reflected to the outside. Uh, what that does is it gives lots of surface area then for other muscles that are going to operate to close the jaw, namely the masseter muscles that we see in mammals. Here is our first clue um, about origins of mammals. These are obviously the pelicosaurs. Uh, we talked a little bit about iconography in, in lecture. Um, notice the big sails. Uh, the spines that support those sails, the neural spines, part of the vertebral column, have grooves, which indicates that there was a large vascular supply to these sails. Uh, and that, of course, indicates that these animals were using those sails for thermoregulatory purposes, much the way a, a jackrabbit uses its ears to uh, re-radiate heat to the environment when it gets too hot. So these animals could have used that uh, that device either to absorb heat when it's cool or to radiate heat, re-radiate heat when they get too warm. Now there are a couple of other uh, features that are um, present within the therapsids and we want to address those uh, just for a little bit here. Uh, the first is that they have secondary palates. Um, there are some reptiles, uh, modern reptiles, that have secondary palates, namely um, crocodilians. Um, but that's sort of a, a specialized adaptation in that group for life uh, in an aquatic environment where they don't have lips. Um, but in mammals, uh, the secondary palate separates the, um, the sinus uh, that comes from your nares um, from the chamber of your mouth where you have the food, which means that you have the ability to eat and breathe at the same time. Because mammals have a high metabolic rate, that's important. Reptiles have low metabolic rates, uh, so if they can't breathe while they're eating, that's not a big deal. Mammals, on the other hand, have to breathe while they eat. That secondary palate separates that sinus from the oral cavity, and you can therefore breathe while uh, you're eating, which is a good thing. Uh, the next thing that we notice in the, in the theriodonts um, is the fact that they have complex teeth. Uh, most reptiles, uh, extant reptiles at least, um, they have a homodont dentition, and I know there are people that will argue that alligatorids do have a heterodont dentition. Uh, in a very narrow sense, they do, but nothing compared to what you find in mammals. Uh, so we have different kinds of teeth in our mouth. Uh, you have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, and if you look at the teeth on your pet cat or dog, you realize that there's a 
um, some very specialized functions going on there. All of that is related to processing of food. When you look at the skull of any animal, the skull is basically this tool that the animal uses to do two things. Uh, one, it houses all the sensory equipment and processing equipment necessary to locate uh, prey. Um, and the second part of it is to process the prey item, whether it's a plant or, or an animal. Um, so if we're trying to understand animals, understanding what's going on with the skull is key. So in this illustration, you can see uh, the transition from pelicosaurs all the way to um, to the late cynodonts uh, and then, of course, the mammals. Uh, and notice what happens in uh, the reptiles. You have seven bones in the in lower jaw. In mammals, there's just one. Notice that in reptiles, uh, the only bone that actually contains teeth is the dentary bone. That's true in mammals as well. So what's happened uh, in the evolution of vertebrates is that the dentary bone becomes larger and larger and larger, and all of the other bones uh, fuse or disappear or move. Uh, the two bones that are key um, for us are the dentary bone, but also the articular bone, which is that bone at the back of the reptilian jaw, uh, which is going to migrate upwards into the back of the skull, and then together with the quadrate bone, become the incus and the stapes. So those two bones that make up the jaw articulation in reptiles become inner ear bones in mammals. Now we talked in class about the fact that uh, reptiles, gators in particular, use that the, the quadrate and the articular bone to transmit sound energy up into the back of the skull, right? Those two bones are still involved in the conduction of sound, but now they are actually located within the inner ear. All right, a few additional uh, characteristics that we talked about in class. Um, and uh, one of the important ones is regionalization of the vertebral column. Uh, so in reptiles, you have uh, cervical vertebra, five cervical vertebra. Then you have trunk vertebra, sacral vertebra, and then um, caudal vertebra. Uh, what mammals have done is they've increased the number of cervical vertebrae, so we have seven cervical vertebrae. Um, the trunk vertebra of the reptile has been divided into thoracic and lumbar, um, and the thoracic vertebrae now contain the ribs, the lumbar vertebrae do not. In reptiles, you can find ribs in the neck, you can find l ribs all the way down the trunk, you can find ribs in the tail, okay? Um, so mammals have restricted those ribs just to the um, to the thoracic region. Uh, and of course, what they do is they suspend the diaphragm between the last, uh, right below the last ribs, and that's used in uh, ventilating the lungs. So mammals have a very uh, specific way of ventilating the lungs that differs from the way that reptiles do that. Uh, the next thing is that the number of sacral vertebrae increases in mammals, and that's because uh, mammals are delivering more force from the back legs to the vertebral column. And of course, if you're going to deliver more force, you have to be able to tolerate that force. And uh, the greater connection there between the vertebral column and the sacrum, the, the pelvic girdle, um, manages to, accompl uh, to accomplish that. Uh, the next thing that you'll notice if you look at the shape of the vertebral column, in reptiles it tends to be uh, straight. Um, and in mammals, it tends to be curved. So in mammals, the vertebral column acts more like a suspension bridge. Um, and what that means is that it's easier to elevate the body above the, above the ground. Um, and with the exception of dinosaurs, uh, reptiles have a sprawling gait or a semi-sprawling gait. Uh, and in mammals, it's more, of an, uh, it's more of an upright posture. So your limbs are moved directly under your body uh, rather than having them splayed out to the sides. Uh, next, let's um, consider this question that was addressed by George Bartholomew um, at UCLA, and that is what came first, uh, the high metabolic rate that you see in mammals or the insulation. Um, and of course, that's a problem uh, because if the insulation shows up before the high metabolic rate shows up, then as Bartholomew illustrated with his experiment with the desert iguanas, uh, you're never going to be able to get up to body temperature 
um, up to your preferred body temperature. On the other hand, if the high metabolic rate evolves first before you have some sort of insulating mechanism to keep the heat in, uh, then you're going to be wasting an awful lot of heat. You're going to lose a lot of heat to the environment and all that heat that you lose to the environment is energy that you can't use in reproduction. Uh, so this is sort of a conundrum uh, that has not been solved. It's unlikely that both evolved at the same time. Uh, so what this implies then is that um, endothermy probably evolved in a very specific kind of habitat uh, where temperatures would have been favorable and it would not have been difficult or the amount of heat loss to the environment would have been minimal. Okay, so uh, the key takeaways then are the uh, attributes that um, mammals have that reptiles don't. Um, and it all basically comes down to this notion of calories in, uh, babies out. Uh, what mammals have done uh, is developed a high cost way of living that enables them to do that uh, to a greater extent than reptiles. Uh, reptiles are very efficient, um, but obviously uh, mammals um, dominate the, the vertebrate fauna uh, that's extant today. Um, so it's a very successful, although expensive, way of doing it. Uh, and of course, you might ask yourself the question, uh, why is it that, that mammals have been so successful? Uh, and I think the way you have to approach that question is thinking about ectothermy versus endothermy. So reptiles are ectothermic, mammals are endothermic. What is it that endothermy does for you. Uh, it's expensive. There must be a benefit to being endothermic. And I think the benefit comes in a couple of ways. Number one, by being endothermic, you are able to exploit times of the day that are not available to a reptile. So you're able to be active uh, when temperatures drop. Uh, it also means that you're able to exploit habitats that are not available to reptiles. So you don't, as you move to the uh, to the poles or to extreme high elevations, uh, the number of reptiles that can make it in those sorts of environments becomes very small. Um, I have seen garter snakes moving across the snow. Uh, it is possible for them to exploit microclimates and, and do that, but clearly they don't have the same sort of success that, uh, that mammals have in those same environments. So what it probably comes down to is your ability to extend your period of feeding and or your ability to extend your period of reproduction far beyond what uh, reptiles are capable of. All right, with that, a uh, little bit more about basic mammal characteristics on uh, our next lecture, and we'll talk about uh, the monotremes and the start of the uh, marsupials. See you guys next time.